Hi everybody, welcome to the third lesson of this course of Geophysics in Python. Uh, well, in the first two lessons we mm, talked about some numerical aspects of Python. Now we will be start talking about inverse problems. Well, let's start with this scheme which uh, summarizes all the main um, aspects relevant um, in defining an inverse problem. So let's start with data. So what is a data? Uh, I'm sure you already have uh, an idea. Let me just uh, clarify that we are going to face with two different kinds of data. One is what we call observed data, uh, which are data coming from actual measurements uh, on the field, on the laboratory. Uh, they are um, came from some kind of experiment uh, and um, often uh, we need to compare them with another kind of data which we call synthetic. Synthetic because it they result from some kind of mathematical or numerical modeling, uh, usually from a computer. Uh, well, mm, an important aspect in inverse problems is the uh, comparison between observed and synthetic data. Uh, that means uh, if you devise a model uh, of the art of some uh, pro geophysical process, um, you compute synthetic data and you compare them with observed data. So uh, usually uh, the model that you choose as a result of your inverse problem is uh, the one uh, whose synthetic data are uh, as close as possible to observed data. But we will discuss um, more detail this about later. Well, uh, from a practical point of view, let me specify that data uh, for our purposes can be always um, specified uh, as an array or a vector of real numbers. Uh, this is because even if you represents the data as a continuous curve. Uh, since we are dealing with computer, we need uh, to deal with discrete data, uh, a finite number of data uh, stored as digital numbers. And well, this is an example of uh, what we mean for data. Uh, when you have an earthquake, uh, seismic waves radiate uh, from the hypocenter and um, reach uh, the seismic stations uh, deployed at the uh, surface of the earth. And peaking uh, the arrival time of uh, seismic waves, which can be P or S, allows you uh, to locate the earthquake. Well, earthquake location is one of the most important among the geophysical inverse problems. Uh, another example of uh, data is the magnitude of the magnetic field uh, measured at, uh, at the surface of the art. This is usually uh, required when you um, are um, doing some kind of geophysical prospection, uh, searching from ores, from uh, subsurface geological structures, and measuring uh, the magnitude of the magnetic fields allows you inferring about um, some um, relevant geological structures in the subsoil. Well, let's now discuss about models. What is a model? Well, the basic definition of a model is that it is a simplified representation of the physical reality. And in our case, physical reality means the structure of the art or some kind of geophysical process. Why simplified? Because, well, it will be impossible uh, to define uh, the finest detail uh, of the art uh, up to molecular scale or the finest, finest details of any kind of geophysical process. So we always need to face with a simplified representation that we call model. Uh, well, as for data, uh, models as well um, can be represented, must be represented as uh, discrete, finite dimensional vectors of real numbers. Even if the model is somewhat related to a continuous quantity like uh, seismic velocity, 
density and so on. Uh, this is because um, dealing with computers will make impossible to deal with continuous quantities. We should always, we must always discretize the models. And okay, let's now define what a forward problem is. Well, a forward problem is uh, something, uh, some mathematical or pneumatic, uh, numerical operators uh, connecting a model with synthetic data. Uh, well, um, basically uh, we can classify uh, forward problems in two different types. One is linear and, one, and the other one is non-linear. What a linear forward problem is? Well, basically it's a forward problem where uh, the, the mathematical operator relating uh, the model with synthetic data can be expressed uh, through a simple um, matrix product. All the other uh, problem, forward problems are uh, called nonlinear. Okay, so let's uh, now um, show an example of uh, a linear forward problem. So suppose we are going uh, to measure uh, the gravity of uh, the intensity of the gravity field through uh, a satellite which is moving, uh, which is flying above the surface. And using, using these measurements, we want to determine uh, the variation of the density within the crust. So um, we need to um, use a simplified representation of the crust. We divide the crust in regular blocks and we suppose that in each uh, of these blocks uh, the density is homogeneous and in each of these blocks uh, the density differs from the average density of the crust by a quantity uh, delta m. So uh, the, the satellite, we suppose that the satellite is flying at a constant elevation h and uh, in each point uh, during its path uh, it measures the intensity of the gravity field which depends on all uh, the blocks of the crust uh, simultaneously, of course. Mm, uh, this is because the uh, gravity uh, travels at, wave, uh, at the speed of uh, light which is uh, much faster than the speed of the satellite. Okay, well, this is uh, a tough experiment. It's mm, not uh, something that can be exactly uh, done in the reality, even if there are satellites able to measure the gravity which are actually used uh, to measure uh, the gravity field. But this is just an example. Okay, so uh, if we consider a single block of crust uh, delta um, with um, uh, the block I uh, with a difference um, in density uh, with respect in mass, sorry, uh, with respect to um, the average uh, density of the crust delta M I, well. And if we call the distance, uh, the total distance between the satellite and this crust, uh, crustal block, uh, Ri, uh, we can uh, compute uh, the variation of the gravity field delta Gi. This is a variation with respect um, to the average gravity field. It's very easy to compute this uh, value because you, we just need to use uh, the Newton, Newton's law of gravitation and some basic trigonometry. Uh, so basically um, the relationship between the mass variation in, the, in this block of the crust is linearly related through these constants uh, in which we can observe the um, gravitational, uh, universal gravitational constants, the satellite elevation and uh, the total distance of the satellite from the block of the crust. So all uh, these quantities in black are a constant so we can group them into a single constant that we call gamma i. 
So the, express, the, the expression is very simple. Now uh, let's try to uh, imagine uh, the satellite moving, uh, flying above the crust and measuring uh, the gravity field in different positions, x1, x2, until the position xj. Uh, well, what we call um, the position of the block of crust y1, y2, up to y i. Okay, so uh, we need to define the distance, the horizontal distance between uh, the, the um, vertical projection of the satellite and the block of crust that we are considering the block i as dij, which depends on uh, the block, the position of the block y i and the position of the satellite xj. Uh, so dij is just the difference uh, of these two coordinates. And well, analog analogously, uh, we can define the total distance Lij, which is the total distance of the satellite when at the position j uh, with respect to the block of crust i. Okay, so this is the expression, the general expression of uh, the gravity anomaly produced uh, by the block of crust i when the satellite is in the position j. So the only difference with respect to the previous expression uh, is the constant gamma which now has two indices i and j to take, in, to take into account uh, the different position of the satellite expressed by j. Okay, so this is the effect of just one block of crust on uh, the gravity. If we want to summarize uh, the effect of all the blocks uh, at the same time, we just need to sum uh, over the index i uh, all uh, the contribution of the individual blocks. So this is the total gravity anomaly measured by the satellite when at the position j. Well, again, this expression is very simple. Uh, it's just uh, a summation of simple products. Okay, we can uh, identify in this expression what we call the data, uh, in this case um, gravity measurements, uh, uh, more precisely gravity anomalies with respect to an average gravity, uh, the model uh, parameters which is the mass uh, variation in each block of crust and these uh, constants relating the model with the data are what we call the kernel of the forward problem. Okay, so this expression can be easily uh, written as a matrix product. If we write all the gravity anomalies, we put all the gravity anomalies into a, a vector uh, with n uh, rows and one column and at the same way we put uh, all the model parameters into a vector having m rows and one column, we can relate them uh, using this matrix in which we put uh, all the coefficient gamma i j. So clearly this is a um, matrix product. <coughs> in this case we have a, a kernel which is a matrix and a vector uh, which is the model and the products of the two give us the synthetic data. <coughs> okay, well, so it's clear that this problem is a linear forward problem. Uh, let us now consider another important forward problem, which is the earthquake location problem. Uh, well, in this case, we have uh, an, an earthquake hypocenter, which is the point in which the earthquake starts. That means the points in which seismic waves start to be radiated. And the seismic waves are recorded by a set of seismometers displaced on the, deployed on the surface of the Earth. And, uh, well, seismic waves propagates 
from the IPO center to each station, uh, we suppose that uh, uh, we assume a very simplified model of the art in which the velocity, the seismic wave velocity, is homogeneous and constant. Well, the expression for uh, the travel time of um, a seismic wave from the IPO center to a station I is very simple, uh, Ti. So we have an origin time which is the time at which the earthquake starts. And we have this other quantity, which is just the ratio between the distance and the velocity. So this is the time uh, seismic waves needs to propagate from the hypocenter to the station. Well, so the, this expression looks very simple, um, and, uh, but there is um, a hidden uh, difficulty intrinsically uh, defined by this expression that now I'm going to show. Uh, well, let's expand the distance. Well, the distance is just the Euclidean distance, which is the square root of uh, the squares of the difference uh, between individual coordinates. So here we have the, dis uh, the difference between uh, the um, x position of the hypocenter and the x position of the seismic station I, the same for y and the same for depth. Uh, well, in this expression we can identify the data, of course, the travel times, the, sorry, the arrival times of uh, the seismic waves. Uh, we can identify model parameters, which are the origin time and the three coordinates of uh, the hypocenter. Uh, well, it's mm, not uh, hard to see that uh, in this form it is impossible to write this expression as a matrix, matrix product. So this is uh, a simple but non-linear uh, forward problem. Uh, there are some tricks which sometimes allows you to transform uh, a non-linear problem into a linear one. This is not the case. So uh, we need to face with a uh, non-linear, even if the earthquake location problem is one of the simplest, uh, it is non-linear. And we will discuss in uh, following lessons the implication of this. Okay, we define it uh, data, we define it model, we define it a forward problem linking a model with synthetic data. Let's now define an inverse problem which is relating observed data with an estimated model. So we define uh, an inverse problem uh, using the expression uh, g to the minus 1. Uh, this is just to indicate that somewhat this inverse, uh, this operator is the inverse of the forward operator, even if it's not mathematically uh, correct. Well, now let's define which are the ingredients uh, required to solve an inverse problem. We are going to give uh, the recipe for uh, the inverse problem solution. Well, first of all, uh, we need data. Of course, uh, data are required to infer about the structure of the art or um, to infer about uh, the, some kind of geophysical process. Um, we need to define a model. This is not uh, an easy task because uh, the same model can be defined using different parameterization, different way to parameterize it. And well, uh, the choice, this choice has a strong influence on the final uh, result of uh, the inverse problem and in general on the definition of the inverse problem. Uh, of course, to do an inverse problem, we need uh, an inverse operator, uh, g to the minus 1, which of course depends on the forward operator. So if uh, the forward operator is linear, the inverse problem will be non-linear. Okay, uh, let me just mention that often non-linear problems uh, can be solved by approximating them um, with uh, linear problem. Well, this is they are not equivalent, it's just an approximation and the final solution to the nonlinear inverse problem can be found by repeated approximation through uh, 
uh, linear problem. So uh, you um, start from an initial solution, you approximate uh, the problem by a linear one, you solve, you get another solution and you start again. Well, but we will discuss uh, in detail about this later. Just let me tell you that even if this is a very common uh, choice when solving inver non geophysical inverse problems, um, it is not always possible. Sometimes you will need to face the nonlinearity of the inverse problems um, as is. Uh, you cannot approximate them by uh, using linear uh, inverse problems. Well, what is uh, the result of uh, an inverse problem? Uh, the most important result, of course, is what we call the best fit model, which is the model uh, whose synthetic data are uh, as close as possible to the observed data. Uh, the definition of um, the, how close they are uh, depends on you. There are different uh, options and this choice uh, strongly influences the way uh, you can solve a problem. So a different uh, choice can make a linear problems to become uh, non-linear and uh, so it needs to be done very carefully. And another uh, important result uh, is the appraisal of the solution. That means we need to define the quality of the best fit model. Just telling what is the best fit model is not enough. We need to tell uh, how reliable is this model. If you need to do some kind of scientific inference on this model, uh, you need to know how confident you can be with uh, this result. Uh, well, we close this lesson just showing a couple of uh, uh, suggested reading. There are two books uh, dealing with uh, the basic theory of uh, inverse problems. And well, see you next lesson. Bye.